16. The Crawling of the Skin As Bond hurtled round the bend, caressing the great car against the camber with an easy sway of body and hands, he was working out his plan of action when the distance between the two cars had narrowed still further. He imagined that the enemy driver would try to dodge off into a side road if he got the chance. So, when he got round the bend and saw no lights ahead, it was a normal reflex to ease up on the accelerator and, when he saw the Michelin post, to prepare to brake. He was only doing about 60 as he approached the black patch across the right-hand crown of the road, which he assumed to be the shadow cast by a wayside tree. Even so, there was no time to save himself. There was suddenly a small carpet of glinting steel spikes right under his offside wing. Then he was on top of it. Bond automatically slammed the brakes full on and braced all his sinews against the wheel to correct the inevitable slew to the left. But he only kept control for a split second. As the rubber was flayed from his offside wheels and the rims for an instant tore up the tarmac, the heavy car whirled across the road in a tearing dry skid, slammed the left bank with a crash that knocked Bond out of the driving seat and onto the floor, and then, facing back up the road, reared slowly up, its front wheels spinning and its great headlights searching the sky. For a split second, resting on the petrol tank, it seemed to paw at the heavens like a giant praying mantis. Then slowly it toppled over backwards and fell with a splintering crash of coachwork and glass. In the deafening silence, the near-side front wheel whispered briefly on and then squeaked to a stop. The chief and his two men only had to walk a few yards from their ambush. Put your guns away and get him out, he ordered brusquely. I'll keep you covered. Be careful of him. I don't want a corpse. And hurry up! It's getting light. The two men got down on their knees. One of them took out a long knife and cut some of the fabric away from the side of the convertible hood and took hold of Bond's shoulders. He was unconscious and immovable. The other squeezed between the upturned car and the bank and forced his way through the crumpled window frame. He eased Bond's legs, pinned between the steering wheel and the fabric roof of the car. Then they inched him out through a hole in the hood. They were sweating and filthy with dust and oil by the time they had him lying in the road. The thin man felt his heart and slapped his face hard on either side. Bond grunted and moved a hand. The thin man slapped him again. That's enough, said Le Chief. Tie his arms and put him in the car. Here, he threw a roll of flex to the man. Empty his pockets first and give me his gun. He may have got some other weapons, but we can get them later. He took the objects the thin man handed him and stuffed them and Bond's Beretta into his wide pockets without examining them. Then he left the men to it and walked back to his car. His face showed neither pleasure nor excitement. It was the sharp bite of the wire flex into his wrists that brought Bond to himself. He was aching all over as if he had been thrashed with a wooden club. But when he was yanked to his feet and pushed towards the narrow side road where the engine of the Citroën was already running softly, he found that no bones were broken. But he felt in no mood for desperate attempts to escape and allowed himself to be dragged into the back seat of the car without resisting. He felt thoroughly dispirited and weak in resolve as well as in body. He had had to take too much in the past 24 hours and now this last stroke by the enemy seemed almost too final. This time there could be no miracles. No one knew where he was, and no one would miss him until well on into the morning. The wreck of his car would be found before very long, but it would take hours to trace the ownership to him. And Vesper. Bond looked to the right, past the thin man who was lying back with his eyes closed. His first reaction was one of scorn. Damn fool girl getting herself trussed up like a chicken, having her skirt pulled over her head as if this whole business was some kind of dormitory rag. But then he felt sorry for her. Her naked legs looked so childlike and defenseless. Vesper, he said softly. There was no answer from the bundle in the corner, and Bond suddenly had a chill feeling. But then she stirred slightly. At the same time, the thin man caught him a hard, backhanded blow over the heart. Silence! Bond doubled over with the pain, and to shield himself from another blow, only to get a rabbit punch on the back of the neck which made him arch back again, the breath whistling through his teeth. The thin man had hit him a hard, professional cutting blow with the edge of the hand. There was something rather deadly about his accuracy and lack of effort. He was now again lying back, his eyes closed. He was a man to make you afraid. An evil man. Bond hoped he might get a chance of killing him. Suddenly the boot of the car was thrown open and there was a clanking crash. Bond guessed that they had been waiting for the third man to retrieve the carpet of spiked chain mail. He assumed it must be an adaptation of the nail-studded devices used by the resistance against German staff cars. Again he reflected on the efficiency of these people and the ingenuity of the equipment they used. Had M underestimated their resourcefulness? He stifled a desire to place the blame on London. It was he who should have known. He who should have been warned by small signs and taken infinitely more precautions. He squirmed as he thought of himself washing down champagne in the Roi Galant while the enemy was busy preparing his counterstroke. He cursed himself and cursed the hubris which had made him so sure the battle was won and the enemy in flight. All this time Le Chief had said nothing. Directly the boot was shut, the third man, whom Bond at once recognized, climbed in beside him and Le Chief reversed furiously back onto the main road. Then he banged the gear lever through the gate and was soon doing 70 down the road. By now it was dawn, about 5 o'clock, Bond guessed, 
and he reflected that a mile or two on was the turning to the Chief's villa. He had not thought that they would take Vesper there. Now that he realized that Vesper had only been a sprat to catch a mackerel, the whole picture became clear. It was an extremely unpleasant picture. For the first time since his capture, fear came to Bond and crawled up his spine. Ten minutes later, the Citroën lurched to the left, ran on a hundred yards up a small side road partly overgrown with grass, and then between a pair of dilapidated stucco pillars into an unkempt forecourt surrounded by a high wall. They drew up in front of a peeling white door. Above a rusty bell push in the door frame, small zinc letters on a wooden base spelled out Les Noctembules, and underneath, Sonnez, s'il vous plaît. From what Bond could see of the cement frontage, the villa was typical of the French seaside style. He could imagine the dead blue bottles being hastily swept out for the summer let, and the stale rooms briefly aired by a cleaning woman sent by the estate agent in Royal. Every five years, one coat of whitewash would be slapped over the rooms and the outside woodwork, and for a few weeks the villa would present a smiling front to the world. Then the winter rains would get to work and the imprisoned flies, and quickly the villa would take on again its abandoned look. But, Bond reflected, it would admirably serve the chief's purpose this morning, if he was right in assuming what it was to be. They had passed no other house since his capture, and from his reconnaissance the day before, he knew there was only an occasional farm for several miles to the south. As he was urged out of the car with a sharp crack in the ribs from the thin man's elbow, he knew that Lashif could have them both to himself, undisturbed, for several hours. Again, his skin crawled. Lashif opened the door with a key and disappeared inside. Vesper, looking incredibly indecent in the early light of day, was pushed in after him with a torrent of lewd French from the man whom Bond knew to himself as the Corsican. Bond followed without giving the thin man a chance to urge him. The key of the front door turned in the lock. Lashif was standing in the doorway of a room on the right, he crooked a finger at Bond in a silent, spidery summons. Vesper was being led down a passage towards the back of the house. Bond suddenly decided. With a wild, backward kick which connected with the thin man's shins and brought a whistle of pain from him, he hurled himself down the passage after her. With only his feet as weapons, there was no plan in his mind except to do as much damage as possible to the two gunmen and to be able to exchange a few hurried words with the girl. No other plan was possible. He just wanted to tell her not to give in. As the Corsican turned at the commotion, Bond was on him, and his right shoe was launched in a flying kick at the other man's groin. Like lightning, the Corsican slammed himself back against the wall of the passage, and as Bond's foot whistled past his hip, he very quickly, but somehow delicately, shot out his left hand, caught Bond's shoe at the top of the arch, and twisted it sharply. Completely off balance, Bond's other foot left the ground. In the air, his whole body turned, and with the momentum of his rush behind it, he crashed sideways and down onto the floor. For a moment he lay there, all the breath knocked out of him. Then the thin man came and hauled him up against the wall by his collar. He had a gun in his hand. He looked Bond inquisitively in the eyes. Then, unhurriedly, he bent down and swiped the barrel viciously across Bond's shins. Bond grunted and caved at the knees. If there is a next time, it will be across your teeth said the thin man in bad French. A door slammed. Vesper and the Corsican had disappeared. Bond turned his head to the right. The chief had moved a few feet out into the passage. He lifted his finger and crooked it again. Then, for the first time, he spoke. Come, my dear friend, we are wasting our time. He spoke in English with no accent. His voice was low and soft and unhurried. He showed no emotion. He might have been a doctor summoning the next patient from the waiting room, a hysterical patient who had been expostulating feebly with a nurse. Bond again felt puny and impotent. Nobody but an expert in jiu-jitsu could have handled him with the Corsican's economy and lack of fuss. The cold precision with which the thin man had paid him back in his own coin had been equally unhurried, even artistic. Almost docilely, Bond walked back down the passage. He had nothing but a few more bruises to show for his clumsy gesture of resistance to these people. As he preceded the thin man over the threshold, he knew that he was utterly and absolutely in their power.